Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 45 of the Old Men Magic Podcast. It is Monday, June 19th, 2023. Thank you for joining us for Casual Cardboard Conversation. If you'd like to support the podcast, please give us a like, please subscribe, please hit that notification bell. We really appreciate it. Alex, we got all our beverages lined up. I got I got a uh, pomegranate juice. I got my coffee. This is my grandma's Dalmatian coffee mug. I got my La Croix ready to go. If anybody nice. from the, the, the La Croix organization, if anybody's listening, we are in the market for sponsorships. I would be, love to be sponsored by La Croix. If you have a small business or something, send us an email. You can contact us at oldmanmagic at gmail.com. We have a Twitter at oldmanmagic. Send me a DM. I'm open to sponsorships of all types. $20 is the going rate, Alex. I'll let you sponsor a podcast for 20 bucks. That'll pay for my editing software for a month. That would be awesome. That'd be sweet. Good. So today we're going to continue our discussion of budget rare cards from the Wrath cycle. Alex, the last two episodes, I've been saying Wrath block. Oh. I've been reading. That's not that's not what most people say. I don't know why. It's Tempest block, Wrath cycle. Same okay. three sets. I don't know why everybody says Wrath cycle instead of Wrath block, but whatever. Well, I guess if you probably like all the blocks are named by the first set in the block. And since Wrath that's isn't true. set, I guess probably. I guess that's true. Probably. I I didn't know why, but now I know why. You told me why. It's very obvious why. That's just a guess. I could be wrong. I, you know, maybe they're not all like that. That sounds right. Previously on the Old Man Magic podcast, we discussed the core set, Tempest. We discussed the second smaller set, Stronghold. Now it's time to move on the final to the final set in that block, Exodus. And we're not remember we're not discussing in these episodes the entire set. We're talking about Interesting budget rares. Things that I found, things that Alex found for under $5 that we'd be interested in brewing with. But first, before we move on to that, we have some general MTG news stuff to talk about this week, Alex. We started this segment last last week with the uh, we had music. We had the animation ring rolling across the screen us chasing the ring frodo chasing the ring no Gollum chasing the ring frodo running away from Gollum. this is our one ring watch segment where we talk about the current big offers for the one ring last week the the bounty was up to what one million dollars alex dave and adam's card world Offered one million dollars to whoever pulled the one ring. Mm. At the time, I said I had never heard of Dave and Adam's Card World. I was looking back through my TCG player orders. I've ordered things from Dave and Adam's oh. Card World, but That's on TCG, TCG player, they're called Dave Adam's Card World. Oh, so that was all screwed up. That's confusing. Dave and Adam's Card World has been unseated as the current highest offer by a healthy margin. Magic the Gathering's one ring card bounty doubles to two million dollars. With only nine days before the card is out in the wild, the one ring's bounty has jumped to two million. This was published five days ago, Alex. So there's only four days left. This set is released on Friday. Pre release stuff was Hot already dog. happening over the weekend. Hot dog. Some people said it was fun to draft like limited play in like limited draft format. They said they were having a good time. I have not been really uh, following the cards that are being released in this set. Mm-hmm. But I did watch a brief clip from Jake and Jeweler Magic where they were reviewing some of their favorite cards from the set. And it looks like there's some really good stuff in this set, to be honest. And in general, I don't, I don't love these crossovers. I don't want to... When I'm playing Magic the Gathering, I don't want somebody to cast a Transformer on me. Just don't want it. I understand just, beca- that. just because. But this is the perfect crossover. I mean, if somebody plays a dragon, if somebody plays a wizard, a hobbit, I don't care. It doesn't take me necessarily yeah, it fits out with of magic's, the game. Magic's theme already. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. 
it fits perfectly. But here is the $2 million offer. Attention, Gremio de Dragones ofrece 2 millones de euros plus el viaje a estancia en Valencia. Plus, there's two pluses, paella. This is fantastic, Alex. So there's, there's this uh, LGS, I was going to say in Brazil. I don't know why I was going to say Brazil, but this is not in Brazil. This is in España. Mm-hmm. Uh, Guild of Dragons offering 2 million euros, which I think is like 2.1, yeah. something like that, US dollars. Correct. Plus, you get a trip to Spain, plus they feed you paella. I like to imagine that every LGS in Spain, like this is what... Like when you go there to like play with cardboard tokens on the weekend, Bill instead of like paella going, yeah, instead of buying like a bag of Cheetos and a Pepsi, <laughs> they always have like a paella chef there. That'd be way better. Paella. It would be so much better. <laughs> uh, I was gonna say, I bet an LGS could do really good business if instead of just feeding people Cheetos and Pepsi, they actually had good food. But yeah, you know, it's been a the LGS game has uh, evolved since we were kids, and it's probably more than just Cheetos and Pepsi and like going to a couple shops down the strip mall and buying a Little Caesars square. There actually are like a lot of like pub type LGS places that sell like decent food. I don't want to say a lot, but I've definitely seen, I've come across quite a few online. They might not serve you paella, but they serve you more than just like. Yeah. Cheetos, Pepsi. Start, they're starting to step their game up. That's, that's cool. Yeah. So yeah, two million dollars. This these people are saying fuck you to Dan Bach. They're saying no. Chase, former NFL player, Chase, what's his face? Five hundred thousand dollars. That's chump change. Two point one million US dollars. Plus you get to go to Spain. Plus you get to go to Paella. Not go to Paella. Get Paella. Eat Paella. Paella comes to me. Yes. Uh, yes, I go to Spain, then the paella comes to me. I think I'd sell to these people if they just matched the previous. Oh, yeah, I yeah, offer for sure. Plus for sure. a trip to Spain, plus paella yeah, Valencia. They sound fun. So that's big news. That's the one ring watch. Definitely. One ring watch. We're Monday now. This was five days ago. I didn't hear about anybody beating this offer the last couple days. Could have happened. If so, I didn't hear about it. Another piece of news, Alex, also Lord of the Rings related. You found this. Somebody found one of the chase rings, the dwarven ring. And not just any serialized dwarven ring. It was number one. It was found. There I is. guess during some pre-release mm. shenanigans. Dwarven ring 001. Of 700, not only was it found, it was immediately sold. Sold, yes. Allegedly pre-sold for $13,000 on June 14th, according to a Reddit post. Remind what me do you again. think about that? The, the, the price? price? Yeah. It seems stupid high to me. But we're now in a world where they've offered $2 million for the one oh. ring. And I was going to say, remind me again what these chase numbered rings are. There's one of one for the one ring. The elven rings, the serialized rings, those are the next rare ones. Is yeah, 300 for elves, 300 for elves, 700 for dwarves, for dwarves. 900 for men. 900 for men. Because okay. there were three, seven, and nine rings for each of them. And then there's nine ring wraiths because those were the nine men that got the rings. Okay. I could not remember. Oh. Um. Uh, yeah, I, a few weeks ago, I would have said that's stupid high. Yes. But now, all of a sudden, without even thinking about it, I was kind of like, that seems kind of low, because I, I guess, you know, the one ring. Uh, so this is what I was going to say, too. Uh, my idea of what these should be worth has been inflated because of these ridiculous yeah. offers for the one ring. And I shouldn't get hasty, because 13000 is a lot. That's like, you know, a Black Lotus. Uh, so, yeah, maybe that isn't that high. <laughs> and there's 700 of them. It's just the number one one out of the 700. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So if you were to pull number uh, 342, it's going to be nowhere near $13,000. No. If you pull number 69, since people are idiots, yes, it might be like $6,500. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> or no, if you sixty nine hundred dollars. If you pull, pull four twenty, it will go for a little more probably. Yes, uh, maybe a few other numbers stupid. like one hundred. You know, like the the even number kind of milestones. I bet like number seven hundred might be decent. Uh, but yeah, somebody might want to be cute and maybe pay more for number seven because they might be wanting to chase like number three of the elven ring number seven yeah, right yeah yeah, ring, yeah number nine yeah because that would be a neat set to have if you had yeah, yeah, yeah number three number seven and number nine that'd be pretty cool i just thought of that and i'm gonna go for that alex so yes first instinct was this is way too high but contextualized with the offers we've seen now for the one ring it almost seems low <laughs> but, but i really don't know it still seems high to me <laughs> I, I don't know what's going to happen with this. If somebody does pull the one ring, who knows if they're even going to get the $2 million or if things could change. We had a little yeah. bit of a discussion about whether or not. Yeah. This and is you know, you like... asked me, I thought about that a little more. I said no pretty hastily. What I probably should have said was like, in theory, yes, but it would be complicated, you know, because they're making an offer. Okay. So yeah. it's, you can accept their offer and form a contract, but like they're going to have, specific language there that I haven't read about the terms of the contract. I'm sure there's a time limit. I'm sure it has to be in near mint condition. I'm sure yeah, yeah. they've written in ways that they can get out of it if they want to. And then you have a whole complicated thing about, you know, even if you could, you know, try to get that enforced, like, are you going to get the actual sale to be enforced, like specific performance, which courts usually don't do to my understanding. Um, so maybe you have a duty to mitigate, to sell it to someone else and you could recover like the difference in the sale price. It's complicated though. Cause to me, you know, this is a one of, you know, it's a unique item. And I don't know, I think you'd have to talk to someone who knew stuff about contracts and like art law, like contracts okay. for sale of that. That would be the person I would kind of try to find because you're dealing with unique things. It's hard to value them. Yes. You know what I mean? Um, I consider them to have no value. I consider right. them to have, this might be, this might sound and strange. I expect but... the value to drop, maybe not yeah. for one ring, but at least for the other ring. So if you can sell these, you know, serialized cards early on, I would, because when the next set comes out, there's going to be more serialized cards and that's what people are going to be spending money on. Yes. You can, va you can price these things, but not value them. So, and price is just based on, what people are willing to pay for something in the moment value in my mind is related to what something produces and you can't value a collectible. It's all based on price. It's all based on what people are interested in, in any given time at any given time. Right. Uh, this $13,000 seems high to me, but low for this particular time. I guarantee you whoever bought this for $13,000 could flip it within a week for more than $13,000. I wouldn't be shocked at all. If that no, happened. no. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's kind of what my thinking was too. I think that's a good way to put it. Yeah. In this hubbub, uh, yes. I could see it going for more, but I wouldn't want to be holding on to that, having paid that much money for it and trying to sell it five years from now. You know what I mean? I'd be scared, but also you and I, you know, we're not rich. We're the type of people who, as soon as we get something that's worth money, we want to sell it because we're scared that it's going to go down. And then in our lifetimes, we've seen instances of, you know, plenty of instances, things that we should not have sold. True. <laughs> should have just kept them. <laughs> this is how rich people get richer. They buy something and give everything. You don't have to yeah. sell any of your stuff. And then some exactly. of it becomes worth money. Exactly. <laughs> Stocks included. <laughs> uh, next piece of news, Alex. Also, Lord of the Ring related. Also, One Ring related. Oh, oh, I know what you're talking about. Pre-release events are happening. People are cracking packs left and right all over the world. Was the One Ring already pulled at a pre-release event? Some people say so. This was going around. I saw this on Twitter. Vinicius. This is why earlier I almost said Brazil instead of Spain. The oh. offer from that uh, card shop is an offer from a Spanish card shop. But this one ring pull supposedly happened in Brazil. Somebody posted this online. Ep at Epic Games Sao Paulo. I'm not showing that, but they have it down here. 
which makes you think, oh, is this is all marketing? This could just potentially be marketing. I'm going to zoom in on a couple things here. First of all, I'm going to say, <laughs> is this a fungal situation going on here with this thumb? We you just guys put on just some scraped glasses. up. I think he's probably just scraped up. <laughs> Very deep grooves in the thumb. Potential fungal situation. Jagged thumbnail. Now to go back to the card. The first thing I always look at in these pictures too is like the the person's like fingernails. I'm like, they almost <laughs> always have like dirty and messed up fingernails. I'm like, come on, guys. This is why I haven't made. <laughs> this is why I haven't made any unboxing videos yet. You have to look like a hand model. I know. Game. I got some, I got an eczema Excuse situation me. going on. My hand can't see it so bad here, but you would be able to see it. If it was close. Those, up. those hands, nice sized, nice sized hands. They're not bad. It's the eczema. I've been struggling with eczema since two years ago. When I first started working in a hospital, I was working with COVID samples all day, every day, constantly scrubbing my hands with hospital grade antibacterial soap. And then I developed uh, what I thought was contact dermatitis <clears throat> and it goes away, but it, it hasn't totally gone away. It comes back every once in a while. But anyways, I mean, off magic card for that contact dermatitis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what, what set they'd work that into, <laughs> but they're creative people. Yeah. Look at it. This is, this is the one ring. Okay. There's a lot to look at here. Hmm. So just first glance, it looks good to me. I can't tell if this is fake or not, but I wanted to know if maybe some other, I'm, I, I figured some people had done some sleuthing. So I looked around on the internet to get an idea if anybody thought this was potentially a fake. And when all of this Lord of the Rings stuff was first being announced by Wizards, they did they put out this pre-release video. They talked yeah. about the rings. They it's actually like showed holding it. They showed an image, a gloved hand. Did, that was that what you just said? Gloved hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They showed an image of what was supposed to be the one ring. This is supposedly the one that they actually put into the packs. And if you zoom in on this, I notice a couple things. If you look just at the serialized portion of the card, mm -hmm. here's the fake one. Well, here's what I think is the fake one. Mm -hmm. This was the one that was open in Brazil. Mm -hmm. I don't think this is real. Here's the one open in Brazil. You look at the spacing in between this median line and the one on the left mm -hmm. compared to the spacing here. Yeah, definitely different. Different, different spacing. And then another thing that people pointed out is if you go down to the hologram, so this image is pretty blurry, but you can get a general idea of the pattern of the hologram on the real one ring. See this median portion that's dark, the bright triangle over there. And if I look at the hologram over here, doesn't look the same at all. It looks like a cat. That looks like a planeswalker symbol, but I don't see any of the same patterning that I see here. That's tough because the hologram could change based on the angle. Really. Now, that's that's what so. I was just going to say. This could be like the Planeswalker mm. region here, and it could be based on the angle and the lighting, that it uh, the parts that shine and the parts that are dark are just way different. Like maybe this is a dark it region looks, here. It doesn't look as... Uh, go back to the other one. The other one looks more... Well, maybe not. Hard to tell. I don't know. When you first showed me this picture, my first thought was like it didn't look real, but I assumed it was because you told me it was real. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But I also didn't have much to go off of. I mean, I just thought it looked a little less like shiny and foily compared to the, the one that they showed. It doesn't look as like silver. Some uh, people said some things about the foiling pattern, but it's so hard for me to tell. Yeah. From this Either particular pictures, image, people I've might have pulled up cards, some better yeah. images. They don't, uh, the color might not come through well. Yeah. And uh, this, like you said, could look different depending on the lighting, depending on the angle. But, but you know, after looking at the hologram, I looked at this. I don't see how this spacing could change based on the lighting, based on the angle that I'm looking at it at, unless it was a very severe angle and I was dealing with, like, foreshortening issues, which I'm not dealing with here. I mean, that card is not angled that much. That really makes me think that it's fake. The spacing is so different. I don't know if I'm crazy. There's a huge no, I think gap. You're right. That looks different to me. There's a huge gap there. 
Yeah. That's very tight. And the line's thicker, it looks like. It does look thicker. This, you have one thickness out on the edges, and this is a thinner The other one looks like all the same thickness. The thickness looks the same here. Yeah. So I think this was just sort of viral advertisement or attempt at a viral advertisement by Sao Paulo Games. Uh-huh. This is a screenshot from Jake or Joel, or Magic, by the way, just to give them credit. I don't know which is which. Jake Joel, Jake or Joel. I watched their show. I don't even know who, who's who. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, I hope it's not real. I hope it isn't found this early. I would really like it not to be found like before the set is like available for general sale. Uh, yeah. I haven't seen anything definite. I saw this. I saw people pull, calling bullshit about this. I looked at the two cards. This to me looks like a fake. And this guy needs to moisturize. That's all I have to say about that. I think we're done. I think that's all for the news this week, Alex. I think we're going to move on to our major segment of the week. Okay. Where we're going to now cover affordable rares from Exodus. Affordable to us means rares under $5. So Exodus is the 14th expansion set. It's the third set in the Tempest block. It was released June 1998. We were doing we were doing some playing back in June 1998, but still Not really this was buying kind of, new stuff though. Apparently we That's... weren't. This was like the tail end of our playing, and yeah. we weren't really buying. I don't think I bought any Exodus packs. <clears throat> the set contained 143 cards, 44 rares, 44 uncommons, 55 commons, and is the first set to color code rarity. That's the other thing. When I came back to Magic, I was like, oh, they color coded. The rarity in the cards. I had, I never owned any cards with color coded rarity. Didn't even know that was a thing they were doing. So, yeah, we definitely were not buying cards. We weren't actively going to LGSs at this point. We were just playing amongst ourselves with the cards yeah. that we had. And I think the thing was, we were focusing bought. on buying older cards if we were buying anything. Yeah. I mean, we we're probably starting to spend money on other things because we were about to graduate high school, you know, but I think we were probably like, saw more value in buying old what are now reserved list cards as opposed to a, a lot of the sets had been stinkers you know oh yeah so ice age was a disappointment although looking back on it not that terrible i mean it, well, it was on an upswing at that point for sure because we you know it had gone through like mirage and weatherlight and tempest yes. so yeah oh yeah uh, it was better but yeah i don't know just we had priority i guess for us we point. definitely felt like we missed the boat when it came to uh, valuable cards at mm -hmm. this point. Like you said, if we were buying anything, we would buy some some older cards because we were like, you're not going to pull anything that's ever going to be there, worth any money. And there weren't many packs. formats at that point either. You were either playing like a format where, you know, the original format with all old cards or you were playing the very newest stuff. So, you know. Type 1 or Type 2. Yeah. And we weren't involved enough in like active deck building and serious play at least to, to really get involved in type two i didn't like type two at that point because it was changing too much yeah well, yeah you had to invest a lot in yes yeah, buying new cards for it yeah we didn't want to do it so we didn't get that involved in the type two in the type two space but you pulled up so this week you went through uh the set and found yeah. things that were interest of interest to you so i'm going to call this segment Exodus rares for under $5 that Alex thinks are interesting. And we're going to have a discussion about them. It was hard enough to pull up pretty much everything, you know, because I wanted to at least look at it, but I tried to trim out a few like cards that were pretty obviously bad. I ended up with some that are not super great. I don't think most of these are amazing, but they're kind of interesting. So I some were... of the, some of the oaths were decent. Some of the spike cards were decent. But yeah. We talked, we talked about, about yeah. The oath, cycle and the spike card so we'll skip those here we don't need to go over those again we'll talk about some of the ones that are new or were new to me first one you pulled up was mindless automaton mindless, mindless automaton this guy's having fun he's mindlessly threshing through some goblins I mean, was our guard. I was just looking at the picture from far away here in the show notes. I thought this was like just greenery. 
like he was uh, trimming. Trucks. I think I did the first time too. Yeah. <laughs> Mindless Automaton is a forecasting cost artifact creature. It was first printed in Exodus. It's been reprinted a few times. Let me see how many times here. Commander Legends and Eternal Masters. March of the Machines, too. The Commander March of the Machines. March of the Machines. Jeez, my uh, screen's going nuts here. I'm going to shrink this down just a bit. Oh, shit. Zoom out. <clears throat> It is a zero zero artifact creature. When Mindless Automaton comes into play, it comes into play with two plus one plus one counters on it. You can pay one colorless, choose and discard a card, put a plus one plus one counter on Mindless Automaton. So you can grow it by pitching a card. Mm -hmm. You could also choose to remove two plus one plus one counters from Mindless Automaton to draw a card. So you can make it bigger by feeding it mana. You can shrink it. And if you shrink it, you get the draw card. You said mana. You mean cards? Sorry, cards and mana. Yeah. I yeah. forgot. About, I wasn't thinking about the discard a card part, part yeah. even though I just read it. Pay one, choose and discard a card. Yeah. It has a current rating of 3.37 on Gatherer. You noted that the time spiral, time shifted version was rated a little bit higher. I've noticed that too on Gatherer uh, where... Something's reprinted. If you go to the different printings, they sometimes have different. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's just because they allow separate sections of comments on each version of the card, yeah. so they're almost always going to vary a little bit. You know, it has uh, a current market price of twenty nine cents. By the way, something I learned here, which you might be interested in, Time Spiral was the set in two thousand and six that was released with a time theme. Time shifted were special cards within Time Spiral that were reprints of old cards. So you have oh, Time okay. Spiral and then Time Shifted, Time Spiral inside. Okay, so they're related. Yeah, it's Time okay. Shifted is just a part of the Time Spiral set. They're the old cards that were included as opposed to brand new cards. Okay, it's like when they do remastered versions now, like Dominary United and Dominary yeah. Remastered. Kind of like the list too, a little bit, yeah. Okay. Um, and then they did another time set just like two years ago or something uh, that's called something similar. They need to do an, a special time set where they reprint Time Twister. Oh, yeah. Call it Time Twisted. Time Twisted. And then you release in that time set somewhere twist. a serialized one of one Time Twister. This is how they can get around. This is how they can reprint. I would not, that would cards. not be a bad way to start getting around the reserve list to just start releasing serialized versions of it. You know, like, but but they got to keep it low because then if yeah. they keep it low enough, it won't actually help anybody get their hands on the cards, but it won't tank the prices either of the old right. ones. If it's like they do something really special, these can be million dollar. Yeah. Are you listening, World, world uh, Wizards of the Coast? I almost said Worlds of the Coast. <laughs> so, what do you think about this card, Alex? Uh, I would First say, thing. oh, sorry. That was okay. a rhetorical question. No, it, it's a it's a real question. But first, I was gonna I was gonna give my opinion. I should have done this the other way around. I should have given my opinion, then ask you what you think. But what I like to do is I like to ask you your opinion, and then before you can give it, I like to give my opinion. So you have to wait, and then you give your opinion when I'm done. Sounds that right. seems like a sensible way to do it. <laughs> so I think that it's good to get cards that you want in your graveyard into your graveyard. Yeah. That's like the only, that's, that's the first thing that popped out to me. Yeah, and it's like not the obvious use for it really, but like I've been thinking that way because I've been thinking about a lot of graveyard decks. So it's nice that you can basically just take whatever card in your hand you want and put it into your graveyard. Mm -hmm. my, my only comment uh, along those lines, my only comment about that then is that over the course of the podcast, we've seen like there's lots of ways to do that. Now, there are so many There's ways to get convoluted. things into your graveyard, so many things to then recover those things from your graveyard. It's like, is this the way you would want to right. do it? Yeah, yeah. It might Maybe be not. within a limited environment, within a draft environment. This might be a good way to do that. But I think if you're playing with a more, uh, with a greater card pool, might not want to use Mindless Automaton. You might want to put some other things in your deck for that purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so yeah, that was basically the first thing I thought about it too. Um, okay. 
the other thing also that it's kind of like a sorry what i'm what i'm trying to say is that with things that involve counters now this might be a good creature because uh oh. you could what am I thinking of? Like doubling season might work on this guy. I don't um, know about I don't know much about doubling season, but yeah, you are right. There are probably all sorts of ways to modify counters nowadays. Yeah, because so if you can add, like, sorry, what I was going to say kind of was that if you can add card counters to him another way, you can use those to draw cards. Yeah, he um, could be a better card draw engine than he was when he was first printed. Doubling season. This is a card I've heard people talk about over and over again. I don't know what it does. It's just been a steady riser. Forever. It might have been in that 30th anniversary advent set. Or not. There was a secret lair version of it, I, I know. I don't think there was, because this is a hundred dollar card. If this if this was in the 30th Oh anniversary, yeah, we would have noticed. Yeah. Yeah. It's been it's so it's not reserve lair. list. Modern Masters, Double Masters, Battle Bond. Double Masters was a big set, right? I mean it's been reprinted and it's still just still just keeps going up. Yeah. And it's uh it's kind of on topic for several of the cards we're talking about today. Uh they either involve counters or yeah, someone mentioned this card in their oh, comments. Oh Jesus. Okay, yeah. I have I've seen this before and I did, couldn't remember what it did. I remember reading it thinking, "Oh, of course this is great. No wonder everybody plays it." I didn't know its effect was relevant to counters as well. It's five mana enchantment. If an effect would put one or more tokens into play under your control, it puts twice that many into play instead. So this is why it was awesome to me. But then there's there's more. <laughs> if an effect would place one or more counters on a permanent you control, it places twice that many on that permanent instead. So geez Louise, no wonder everyone's does a lot. Yes. Yeah. Uh, go down. A little bit and look at the... I like the one that has the dinosaurs on it. I just want to look at that because I like dinosaurs. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I like dinosaurs. Modern Masters. Double Masters. Was it a oh, extra? Yeah. This one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Dinosaurs. Look, there's more than one dinosaur coming out of the same yeah. egg. Double dinosaurs from the same egg. Are they from the same egg or there's just two eggs? Maybe you doubled the eggs. Uh, maybe the eggs were doubled, yeah. Yeah. Same outcome. You still get two dinosaurs yeah. instead of one. Yeah. I like that art. Uh, this one's even more expensive. Yeah, I was going to say, or I was get, wondering if any of them were cheaper. The only thing that's bucks. weird about this card is that the two, it does two good things, um, but they're fairly separate. So it's sort of like, yeah. I'm wondering if you're going to easily be able to make a deck where you can make use of both things that it does, as opposed to just one. I don't know. I don't play with counters that much, but I'm always playing with tokens. Uh, that's where my mind obviously went. But yeah, I don't know how much overlap there are between token generators and counter putter honors. Yeah, if you could make a deck that does both, that'd be sweet. But this anyway, is the cheapest sorry, one. Tangent there. Um, 8250 for this battle bond. It is the least interesting art to me, which is probably why it's the cheapest, but it's yeah, still 85 it's bucks. Not, it's not bad, but it's, I don't know. Doesn't do anything to, for me. Yeah, so that was our doubling season segment. <laughs> <laughs> doubling yeah, season. Automaton, I mean, I don't know. He's only four casting costs. Some of these cards, like Triskelion, six, right? Yeah. Five or six. Uh, in the right deck, of course. Like, that's what I'm going to say about a lot of these cards, I think. In the right deck. You know, if you don't mind cards going to your graveyard, then yeah, then this guy's like a way, I don't know, like a a buffable creature that you can also draw cards from. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> I do like Triskelion way more though. Triskelion, you 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 use them to ping uh, creatures. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'll never forget. I don't know if I've said said this before, but when we first came back to Magic, I'm looking through all the old sets. No, I wasn't looking through all the old sets. I was watching. I was looking at something online. I don't know if I saw somebody's Twitter post or if I was watching gameplay on YouTube. Somebody played a Triskelion. And I thought, oh, that's funny. That guy put googly eyes on his Triskelion. I thought, he had, it, this, yeah. I thought he had it modded. <laughs> and then no, later I realized that's googly. the actual art. I forgot. I totally forgot about that. Also, you know what? I'm looking at Mindless Automaton more now, too. And I think I might have overlooked the fact that 
you have to remove two counters from him to draw a card. Yeah, so he's so one card. It starts to get expensive to like load him up if you want to draw cards. You can make him bigger, but yeah, so I don't know. I don't know that I'd ever really play this, but yeah, playable, but there's probably better ways to do the things that, that he does. Yeah. Next card's better though. Second one. I'm interested I, in what you have to say about this. Cause... Oh, I don't know if I have too much to say about it. I feel like it's kind of obvious, but just a straight I just forward, like how cheap it is. Straightforward creature. Yeah. Sky Shroud. In the right color. It's cheap. Sky Shroud War Beast. So oh, this is a War Beast. That's sweet. One colorless, one green casting cost. Star Star. Summon Beast. It has Trample, which is great. I love Trample. Sky Shroud War Beast has power and toughness, each equal to the number of non-basic lands target opponent controls. It has a rating of 3.68 on Gatherer, current market price of 56 cents at the time we wrote our show notes, now down to 59. This might Whoa. be the time to establish your Sky Shroud War Beast position. Alex says, I like it. Cheap cost, trample grows. No reprints if I ha hadn't said that yet. I think it is yeah. okay. So my thoughts on this card are, well, my first thought was, is this ever going to get bigger than 4-4? Four, four? Probably not. Okay. Now, if it doesn't get bigger than 4-4, four, four, you might say, who cares? You pay two mana for a 4-4. Four, four, four. But at the time you play him, he's not going to be 4-4. Four, four. At right. best, he's yeah. going to be 2-2. Two, two. Yeah. So I think most of the time you're just you're not getting anything special out of this guy. You're probably getting something that's on curve at best when you play him. Okay, yeah, that's fair. And what do you do if this guy's in your hand turn two? You could be playing an Elvish Archer, but instead you have a Sky Shard War Beast in your hand, and your opponent just hasn't played any non basic lands yet. Yeah. Now, target opponent. This could be better in. Oh, I'm uh, looking this up right now, actually. This could be better in commander early game, but still, I, even late game, I don't know that it gets bigger than 4 4. I don't know how many how many times you're going to be playing against somebody who has more than four non basic lands down. Unless you're playing old school and everybody's just playing all dual lands, but then if you're playing old school, you're not playing this guy. It will not let me look this up for some reason. So I think he's okay, but I think that his potential upside isn't great enough to outweigh his potential downside. I'm just trying to, th I'm thinking about all the times I'm going to wish I had like an Elvish Archer or another like 2-2, two, two, two mana green creature in my hand instead of this guy. Because my opponent doesn't have any non-basic land yet. I know the real reason you picked this card, Alex, because he's riding a dinosaur. You just said, you just ex <laughs> expressed your love for dinosaurs. <laughs> Actually, I don't know if that's a dinosaur. I, th I thought this was a Triceratops, but that's not a Triceratops. It looks kind of like the monsters from Altered Beast. It's just some type of beast, yeah. It's a Triceratops with a Velociraptor body and I don't know what kind of claws. And tusks. Try to see. So what I was thinking about with this card, I was probably just estimating differently the number of non-basic lands you're going to see. One of the comments mm -hmm. on Gatherer was like, back when this was printed, it was almost useless, but now with some mana bases contain only one to four basic lands in a deck with 25 lands, this would be much more powerful. Um Maybe I'm underestimating the number of non-basic lands people play in Commander. Is I'm assuming this is mostly related to commander play i don't know and I, I mean either way um someone on here is talking to me. people on here are talking about it being commander yeah you don't get to choose a new player oh okay so i'm not sure if there was any some confusion about that because some people are saying uh this card is really good in edh right this has edh secret tech written all over it uh but they don't really say why Yeah, 
Is there any card out there where you can turn your opponent's basic lands into a non-basic land that just does the same thing, but you just call it non-basic? Oh, I don't even know if that makes any sense. They probably never made a card like that. No, I mean, I, I know what you're saying. I was wondering something similar too. Yeah, if you can turn, you can definitely like add a land type to a card or change its land type, but I don't know if that makes it, even adding a land type might not, you know, like if you have a forest and I have a card that says yeah. it becomes a mountain too, I think it's still a basic land, maybe. Yeah, just an enchanted basic land or a basic land yeah, that has been modified. Two modified. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the deal is with this card. I think it's so-so. But it's 50 cents. What do you want, people? Yeah. <laughs> Next one, Alex. I know, so the first two cards... Or this one, at least, not the first two cards. This card came from your love of dinosaurs. This next card came from your love of Thopters. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. Thopter Squadron. I overlooked all these cards when I was uh, going through Exodus because as soon as I see plus one, plus one counter, my, I just move on. <laughs> <laughs> Thopter Squadron. Five colorless artifact creature... Zero zero flying. Doctor Squadron comes into play with three plus one plus one counters on it. So basically, it comes in three three flying for five. You can pay one mana to remove a plus one plus one counter from Thopter Squadron. You then put a Thopter token into play. Treat this token as a one one artifact creature with flying. Play this ability as a sorcery. So you can split him into three one ones. You could also pay one colorless, sacrifice Thopter to put a plus one, plus one counter on Thopter Squadron. Play this ability as a sorcery. You could break them up and and, and recombine them. Mm -hmm. okay. And with other Ornithopters, you can cast zero casting cost Ornithopters and then sacrifice them to make him bigger. I did see that. It has a rating of 3.44 on Gatherer. Current market price is 67 cents. Yes, you said it works with other actual ornithopters too. The original zero casting cost zero two ornithopter can be fed to the squadron. Yeah, they count as thopters now, and there are several other thop <clears throat> thopter cards as well. People use this with doubling season, which we've just discussed. <clears throat> Mana Echoes, Thopter Foundry, Hannah Ships Navigator. I had a question. Can you convert your ornithopters into 1-1 one -one flyers? Why did I write that question and does that even make sense i guess you could you could convert your ornithopters into one one flyers but would you want to do that yeah you can do it indirectly you sacrifice yeah. them to grow him and then you split them back and then off you split it off if you need more offensive capability yes yes you can do that i want to look up thopter foundry because i have never seen that card and i uh -huh. don't know exactly what it does but i have yeah, an feel idea free to look up any of these right now i can remind you what Mana Echoes does too. If that's a red enchantment we've talked about recently. Doctor Foundry. Mana Echoes makes whenever a creature enters the battlefield, you can add mana equal to the number of creatures you control that share that creature type with it. So every time you're creating an ornithopter oh, yes. with this guy, you're getting mana for all the ornithopters you have. And then when you lay down zero casting cost ornithopters, you're getting mana. So that's kind of neat. Enter the battlefield <clears throat> triggers. Does it happen when you create a when you create a token? Sure, yeah. Probably. So yeah, this guy could just you could constantly be using this guy to trigger enter the battlefield effects. Mm -hmm. Breaking them apart, recombining them, breaking them apart again uh -huh. into it's the giving tokens. you mana every time you do that. Equal to Thopter. the number of thopters you control. Thopter Foundry <clears throat> first. Printed in Alara Reborn. We have not, I don't even know when the set was printed. We're nowhere near this set. As one of yet. those wonky double mana signs, which means I, I know I'm out of my element. Don't know what that means yet. I've been told, but I blocked it out of my you mind. I'm not ready. Either black or white. Not ready for that. You're like, I was still a listen. <laughs> I already wiped it out of my mind. Doctor Foundry. Steve. I don't know how to cast Doctor Foundry. It's an artifact. <laughs> you pay one colorless, sacrifice a non token artifact. But these guys are tokens. Put a Thopter token into play. 
Put a 1-1 one, one blue Thopter artifact creature token with flying into play. You gain one life. So you would have to sacrifice a different artifact to the Thopter Foundry to create a Thopter that you, then you can combine with your Thopter Squadron. Hmm. I didn't right. notice the, to the token thing, but people did mention this card in the comments, so it must still be considered useful. Um, yeah, well, like you, would ha you would have to be sacrificing not one of the things that the, the Thopter Squadron made. Yes. But you could still remember ornithopters are zero casting costs. So you could be putting down your ornithopters too, yep. and you can sacrifice them and turn them into <clears throat> one one ornithopters and you flyers. Can, it's not you could anything. still you could sacrifice other things too, like shield spheres or anything. Right, yeah, yeah, your other, yeah. And since you're playing a thopter deck, you probably have a bunch of like low casting cost artifacts and defensive artifacts that you, you know, maybe don't mind sacrificing. But yeah, I don't know. I this wonder... one's my favorite pick as far as the cards that work well with Thopter Squadron. But but I mean, it's interesting. It gives you more yeah. more things to feed into your into your squadron. Yeah. Uh, also, it doesn't. You don't have to use this ability as a sorcery like you do with the Thopter Squadron. So that might give you some more flexibility, like being able to do it as an instant. You know. I'm having trouble with my uh that's okay. My we'll screen today. Together. My my keypad is not very responsive, so I'm trying to move things around, increase the size of things, shrink things. It's just not working very well. Next one. I don't know what I don't know what Hannah Ship's navigator is either. I might have seen this oh, before and just we talked about her before. She's sort of like a guardian beast. She's a white okay. white legend and she helps protect oh. artifacts. Yes. Yes. I've looked at this recently and oh. thought I should buy a copy of this. I was mistaken. I'm sorry. She No, that's not the card I was thinking of. She does something similar still. You return them to your hand from your graveyard. Hand of Ships Navigator. One colorless, one white, one blue. One, two creature legend. One colorless, one white, and one blue tap. Return ar target artifact or enchantment card from your graveyard to your hand. Okay. Okay. I think what you're getting at there is players zero casting cost ornithopters, feed them to the squadron, bring them back with the ship's navigator. Do it I again. Guess, yeah. Someone else suggested it. Okay. Um I was when I saw it, I didn't even I, I was thinking of Hannah's custody. That's the one that's okay. like Guardian Beast. It's okay. a white enchantment artifacts cannot be the target of spells or abilities. Okay. Both of that. Yeah, both of that can work here. I'm thinking of a fun deck. Uh I just got to get my moat back again. I, get, I make a moat. <laughs> Track thopter. down that guy. <laughs> There's a moat. At, you know that uh, uh, LGS that I found the pre-modern lands at? They have a yeah. moat. Oh, yeah? Yeah, it's pretty beat up, and it's still like 900 bucks. There's like a, a handful of them for sale, I think, at MTG Seattle. I think they're like all graded or some of them are graded. I'm hearing some of the YouTubers that I listen to, Alpha Hoarder, a couple other guys who have mostly collector-based YouTube channels. They've been talking about now for months, like the softening of the high-end collectible market. They keep talking about these drops in prices. I'm not seeing it yet in the stuff that I really want to buy uh -huh. that's expensive, like the dual lands. But I think those are... Probably be, maybe it's because those are more playable, and the stuff that they're looking at is mostly collector specific. Like yeah, I think the dual land has a stickier, like they're stickier with the, at their price because of the play demand. Yeah, but I am seeing like softening of prices and other things that are still playable, but not to the same extent as like a dual land where everybody who plays Magic might well, at some point like to get four of every dual land for different sets at, at a minimum for different formats at a minimum one of every dual land for commander i'm going to bring this up real quick i noticed i i bought one ball lightning and this is where i'm again going to talk about if you have old school cards that you never bought they got very expensive because there was that post covid spike but i do think a lot of them are going to come down they are starting to come down just dollar cost average into the stuff slowly establish your play sets maybe buy one a year Ball Lightning, I bought one Ball Lightning so far. I paid almost $60 for it. I bought it almost at the peak. Wow, damn. 
This is dropping. If you go on TCG Player right now, I did this yesterday. There are a lot of ball lightnings, light play for 30 bucks. Oh, nice. I bought my light play one six months ago for almost $60. They've dropped 50%. Uh, and I started looking at some other things too, like Creature, some other cards. I know you've dark. watching Creature. Yeah, that, that are playable. Uh, I watch that too. I was one of the ones I always check because I want to see if it's coming down. Things are starting to come down. That's my. That's, that's my. I've seen it too. Point. I've seen things coming down. Like you see, yeah, not not dual land so much. They were for a minute. I saw some cheap, but yeah, some of the stuff that maybe just got caught up in the hype. That is, yeah, yeah. Uh, but still, things that are playable, but just maybe not as widely desired. Right I don't. Unlimited I don't know. Berserk. Like ball lightning's high, highly playable, but. There are only you're not going to play ball lightning in every deck. It's three red. Yeah, it's going to be a red aggro focused deck. And yes, everyone likes to play red aggro focused decks, but not all the time. The ball lightning is probably going to go in almost all of them, but it's never going to go in your blue white control deck. You know, dual lands you just you want them all the time for every format for almost every deck you play. Yeah, MTG Seattle has four graded moats, all nine point fives. All twenty five hundred and fifty dollars. <laughs> yes, yeah, see, I have zero interest in that. I want like, I so want a five. I want a five hundred dollar moderate to light play moat. Yeah. Even then, I won't be happy about paying five hundred dollars for it. But yeah. I might. Will they ever get that low? I have no idea. I don't know. It never happen. Cards. I know I've said that a million times before, but no thanks. Yeah. No. I. I don't either. I'm. I'm gonna want to play it in a sleeve, even if it's really expensive. I'm still gonna want to sleeve it up, and put it in a sixty card deck, and play. Something just sits there in plastic. Uh, that's just not for me. All right. Well. Next Anyways, card. Ball lightning. Next card, ball Alex. Lightning. I really, I really like this one. This one. Do like you good? I'm glad. Okay, I'm glad I didn't come up with all stinkers. <laughs> You didn't come up with any stinkers. You found things that you liked for under five dollars. <laughs> well, now, I mean, is... I don't know. I won't buy most of these probably, but I thought they were interesting at least, worth talking about. This is pretty good, though. I think it's solid, at least for back in the day. It is Paladin and Vec. It was printed in Exodus Ninth Edition and Tenth Edition. It is one colorless, two white, summon knight for a two-two. Uh, first strike, protection from black, protection from red, night. It has a rating of about 4.2 on gather. Its current market price is 77 cents. So I just really love this creature. I, I love this card. I love creature-based decks. Love creatures. I like just a solid, barely costed creature. It's just mm -hmm. like a stalwart. He's not huge. He's just he's 2-2 two -two with a couple abilities. It's hard to kill. He has first strike. He's fair and good. Mm -hmm. These are the kind of things that I like. Eh, I said it hits me right in the feels the same way like a longbow archer does or the pump knights do. Like just these solid, low casting cost creatures with some special abilities, but they're not unfair. They're not going to warp the game. They're just damn solid. They're damn yeah. good. I want to I want to line this guy up to some next to some longbow archers in a pre-modern uh, white weenie deck. I like this guy a lot. Also, he's Remind a knight. Longbow archers. Knights are soldiers too, right? So, I mean, this guy has soldier. Am I wrong about that? Or knights also oh, soldiers? Oh, 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 oh. Uh, Guess he doesn't have to be to be sweet. I, he can no, I be think sweet. he's just a knight. Okay. I think you're thinking of with uh, Azen Crusader, whatever it says. <clears throat> Longbow Archers is this two white, two two that can block flyers from visions. Yeah, okay, okay. I, I remember that. Block your hypnotic specters. Cha chow. Plus, you pump him up with a couple crusades. He's four four. He's blocking. He's blocking. Oh, yeah. Sarah Angels, not just blocking them, yeah, killing them. Yeah, that's a good card. Yeah. Um, what was I just saying? Ace and Crusader, Knights oh, yeah. and Soldiers. I'm trying. I have to get to the bottom of this this association you have now. That something's changed. Um, okay. Soldiers, Warriors, Knights, 
there's now like a subgroup. I think like warrior contains several different things. I don't know. Ace and Crusader. Okay. Okay. Ace and Crusader said, Ison, whatever, said heroes. And now it says soldiers and warriors. Okay. And she is a knight. <laughs> oh. That's all over the board. <clears throat> Are knights warriors? No. No. Uh, uh, no. I have to look up warriors now. We looked this up because it was a factor in the Dungeons and Dragons related sets because they've done this thing. Maybe it didn't start with that. It might go back farther, but like, I think they made everything that's a human fall into a D and D like category, like warrior or. Okay. But regardless, you're going to look it up in the background, regardless of whether or not Paladin and Vec which is a knight can also be considered a soldier. Like this is a sweet card. I like this card. I'm going to be buying some of these. I would love to drop some longbow archers on turn two and then drop a paladin and Vec on turn three. I'd be an excited man. And you can't bolt him. You can't terror him. Not that you could. I was going to say not that you could ever terror him, but you could, of course. Terror does kill white creatures. That's why you sideboarded in your terrors when you were... Going up against somebody who had a bunch of Sarah Angels. That's why people spike black into their green decks and old school just for the terrors, so they can take care of the Sarahs. Under a dollar, why would you not pick up some powder effects? I'm gonna move on to the next one real quick, Alex. Wait, sorry, you Carol, keep, you... I'll find I'll tell you what I looked up. Okay. There's, there's a thing called the party, which I didn't realized before a player's party consists of up to one each of up to one each of creatures with four creature classes cleric rogue warrior and wizard player controls a full party if that player fills all party roles with four different creatures of the appropriate types okay. what are you talking about? what is this about <laughs> some cards have bonuses if a player has a full party meaning that all roles <laughs> are fulfilled i haven't that come up with Huh? I haven't come across anything like that yet, have you? It's very new. Well, they used it in the D&D sets. That's uh, okay. like Zendikar Rising. Okay. I don't know. Sorry. We're way off the we're way off topic. We can get back to that. I'll look it up more. <laughs> is a knight a soldier? Stay focused, Alex. You're telling no, me about no, parties. Knight is okay. not a soldier, no. Okay, that's all I need to know. <laughs> Next card. By the way, yeah, there's there's a couple like multicolored removal spells that we've talked about that I think that works on now too, you know, that are like white black or black red. So that's like uh terminate and oh yeah, you said someone commented on plentiful white removal making him less good now. Thoughts, maybe better knights sideboard. I don't know if there's better knights. I do really like this guy. He has first strike and two protections, whereas most knights have first strike and one protection. You're telling me maybe the two protections aren't as worthwhile now. Someone suggested that they were like people use white more for creature removal, but I mean even that comment's old now, so I don't know if that's the you know yeah. case. Uh, even back at like back in the earliest days, white had like the best creature removal card anyways right. to be source the plowshares. This right. and your white knights were always a. So you might have that's that's all I was saying. That's one con for him, maybe that you know, yeah, you might be able to easily remove him anyways. But hey, hey, I mean, you know that going in, you know what he has protection from and what he doesn't. I like him. He might he might go in on my protection from red inferno, earthquake deck. Oh, that'd be sweet. Yeah, it's a good idea. Next card: limited resources. Limited resources. I was excited about this because I had not seen it before. I learned about this. I had looked it up really quickly when I first started this re review of cheap rares from the Tempest block. I just briefly browsed Exodus and this one popped out to me. It is a one white casting cost enchantment. When limited resources comes into play, each player chooses five lands he or she controls and sacrifices the rest. As long as there are 10 or more lands in play, Players cannot play lands. So you put out limited resources. If there's already more than 10 lands, no, if each player, if any player has more than five lands already, 
you have to whittle down to five. Yeah. If you play it early in the game, it's one casting cost. You can only play up to 10 lands in the entire game. Yes. Very Total interesting card. You and your opponent. Total, yes. Yeah. 4.275 on Gatherer. It's reserve list. It's banned in Commander, which Bang. I didn't know. And that is explaining why it's not more expensive. <laughs> I think. Because yeah, I feel like this would yeah. be more expensive. Yeah. But you can Current. see why it's banned in Commander because it puts a hard cap at 10. Yeah. You know, which means now there can only be 10 lands in play amongst four people, which would just be ridiculous. Yeah. Uh. Current market price of $1.83. It did have a brief attempted spike, came back down. I like this card. This I seems like too. a very fun card to try to brew with. I it's don't see one. Sorry, good. I don't see a lot of attempts to work this into decks in the pre-modern space. Maybe there's somebody out there brewing with limited resources. Maybe it always it was already tried a bunch back in the day and people just can't get it to work. It's never as good as they want it to be. But let's say you could just play it in a casual deck. Who cares? I think this would be fun in a casual deck, kitchen table yeah. deck, a deck. You could spend a lot of try, time trying to optimize this deck. This could keep me busy, I think. Hmm. Interesting combos. You wrote some things down. Exploration, Summer Bloom. Lotus Veil, Planar Birth, Blocks Fast Bond. I like it. I like the art. It is really cool art. Great lines. You asked what else has Keith Parkinson's Parkinson done? I found something like the next day that he had done too, by the way. But I looked stuff up too and I was like, oh, of course. And it's funny this art popped out to you and you were like, I wonder what else this guy has done because one of Later. the other cards he uh, illustrated from the same exact set I picked up recently. And one of my favorite things about this card is the art. And I've looked at this art and been like, this guy's awesome. What else has he done? Mind over matter. It's very similar style. style. Oh. The clothing is very ornate. The coloration is excellent. Mind over matter. This is oh, like... These are probably my two favorite pieces by this guy, Mind Over Matter and Unlimited Resources. He likes very expressive hand gestures. I've noticed that because I looked up oh, his art on well, uh, I need to, uh, I need to remember the other card. It's a black card. I was just looking at Dance of the Dead, so that's what I'm trying to say, but it's not. But it's a similar thing. There's two like spirit figures dancing together. He uses the same he uses the ha same hand motions. And that yeah. that are that are used in limited resources. I know exactly what you're talking about because it's probably my third favorite piece of art that he's done. Oh, I can't remember exactly what it's called, but it is Dance of something, probably Dance of Death. I found it. Death's Death's duet. <laughs> Damn it! This is funny because the way the text appears on the card, like if you're looking at it, it's small. I saw someone in one of the comments on it said. I used to think this card was called Death's Duct. Oh. <laughs> Dance to it. Expressive hand gestures. Yeah. He likes he likes doing this. Jazz, jazz hands. And all of his art. But anyways. Very cool. Limited resources. Yeah, this is like a one, it's a one casting cost, like key component to a lockdown deck. I like that. Easy to get out. Um, you play with another thing to lock people down. Exploration is a green enchantment, also one green, also something you can play very quickly. And exploration lets you play, I don't remember, it lets you play more than two, like two lands a turn, or if you can drop as many lands as you want a I turn. Think it's as many. And this is coming down after a reprint recently. You may play an additional land each turn oh, just exploration, one so you can drop two. So the idea is to play limited resources, exploration, play double the lands of your opponent each turn, so you can have, so you'll reach that. Yeah. So when you reach you that reach 10 cap. land limit, you'll have more lands than your opponent. Mm -hmm. Summer Bloom allows you to play up to three additional lands this turn. It's a sorcery. That's a modern card. Okay. Uh, but yeah, this guy's at first turn forest exploration, then plains limited resources, then horn of greed. Uh, 
Remind me Horde of Greed again. I know it's lands. You're Whenever a player lanes. plays a land, that player draws a card. Okay. Okay. And if you have something like Exploration down, mm. maybe if you draw another land, you could you yeah. can play it again. Plus down a bunch of lands real fast. Uh. <clears throat> it's interesting you, you said Lotus Veil, because I have a Lotus Veil that I opened from a Weatherlight pack back in the day. And I'm always like, what am I supposed to do with this card? I still don't <laughs> like it. See, I like it, but I know that it's not like the right pick. Like I, I want to make it work because I like it, but you know, uh, it's gonna get strip mined, or or it's yeah, it's, it's just it's a lot to invest mind. into one land that will produce multiple mana. You're you're putting all your eggs in one basket. Now, when would you use Lotus Fail? Crucible of Worlds, Alex. There you go. Again. Um, so these are all ways to get out the limited resources and then try to play lands faster than your opponent. So when you reach that 10 land limit, you have a lot of lands. Your opponent has very few. Yeah. Or one of your lands is a Lotus Veil. It gives you three. Yeah. Um, what I was thinking is Dingus Egg, by the way, because it deals damage when the lands get destroyed. So if you did this when, uh, like later in the game, they'd lose a bunch of lands all at once. <clears throat> and Planar Birth really? is a sorcery from Urza's Saga. Put all basic lands from all graveyards into play under their owner's control tapped. Okay, so I read this very quickly and I didn't quite understand the combo. <clears throat> and I'm still not understanding it for some reason. So you you have the limited resources out already? I think. You play the limited resources. By the way, this guy mentions this right after Dingus Egg. He is the best land destruction spell ever made for a Dingus Egg, Tex with Planar Birth. Oh, so. okay. Okay, so it's not just Planar Birth. Okay. So the idea is you play the limited resources, you play the planar birth, you make them put all the lands back into play, and then they have to sack them again and take damage from the dingus egg. Yeah, or you could, I mean, I guess you could do it in either order. You know what I mean? You could you could use planar birth and bring a bunch of lands back into play. Well, I, you wouldn't need to because you haven't destroyed them yet, so never mind. <laughs> what I was thinking was instead of trying to play limited resources and then get lands on the board faster than your opponent, what if you just play limited resources, you each go down to five land, and then you just start whittling away their land with land, land destruction. Yeah. yeah, I thought about that too. It's just, I mean, it would just go great in the land destruction deck. Yeah, because every time you you nail one of their lands off the board... Then you play your land. And even in reverse yeah, order, if you start out you know, destroying their lands and you get that edge, and then you play limited resources, then you hit that cap and now they can't play any more lands. Yeah, it's good. It's good late game and early game. Yeah. You don't need to get it out. You don't need to play it. Yeah. I'm uh, surprised I haven't yeah, I've heard of this more, seen it more. I'm surprised it's not more money, even being banned in EDH, because it seems like a legit card for a 60 card deck. Yes, I want to do some land destruction shenanigans. White green oh, land destruction. Deck. You know, everyone hates it and it's so nasty, but it it just reminds me of like I don't know. It's fun. I love land destruction. <laughs> I mean, my my mono green deck since she played me last, it's gone heavier uh, in land destruction. It uh -oh. used to just be the four thermocarsts. I mean, not the not. It used to be the four winter's grasps. Now I've gone I've gone heavy. Uh oh. I, no, I, I, mean, I, I guess I always wanted to play a land destruction because I couldn't afford to back in the day. Like people had like ice storms and sinkholes and they were out of print and already like, you know, more expensive than I had pocket money for. So I, yeah, I, I we just had like uh, unlimited era beta era kind of thing that I didn't have access to. And I always wanted to try it out. Yeah. We just had strip my, I'm sorry. Uh, Stone Rains from Revised. Yeah. Later on, the strip mines were available to us. After yeah, because they, were they weren't even in print yet at us, like for, for us in Revised, like there were no strip mines, it was an expensive card. And then they put it in whatever, fourth edition, fifth edition. Yeah. Uh, plus, we've seen some new land destruction or similar to land destruction cards. I'll uh, mention it a few times and I keep forgetting what it's called, but it's. um. It's right on the tip of my tongue. It's a red spell that 
prevents them from playing a land for one turn and you draw a card. Um, so it has the fun same function as land destruction. It puts them one turn back on a land. It is called... I, all I can think, think of is Thermocursed because you just said it. That's just a land destruction. Yeah. Two green, one white, destroys a land. It's called Sol Soltara from Visions. I don't know what you're talking about. Really? It's a card called Soltara from Visions? Solf 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 Soltara? Yeah. I have no memory of this at all. Soltara. I thought we mentioned it on another episode. I got I ordered some a couple months back because I thought it was good. And we might have, and I forgot about it. I forget about things all the time. <laughs> Two colorless, one red instant. Target player cannot play any land cards this turn. Then you draw a card at the beginning, next turn's upkeep. So I like that. Compared to Stone Rain always seemed like a little clunky. It was like, you know, the the baseline average land destruction spell. And it's like, oh, sinkhole's better because it's two mana. And Ice Storm's mm -hmm. better because it's off color and in green, you know. Uh I like this because you could you get to draw a card. Compared okay. to Stone Rain. Later in the game, it probably matters less. The effect starts to wear off when they get to catch up to you, maybe. Yeah. But if you never let them catch up, if you're playing it in land destruction, I'd rather play, you know, that instead of Stone Rain alongside my black or green sinkhole or whatever else I was going to do, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. I like limited resources a lot. I'm definitely going to pick some up and play around with it for a buck 80. Come on. Why not? And it's rare. Did I say it's never been reprinted, I think? He said it was a reserve list. Oh, yeah, that's right. It's a reserve list. Okay, so yeah, yeah it's never been reprinted. For $1.80, why not? There's also a podcast called Limited Resources. This must be, it's the, oh. the podcast is about uh, the limited format. But I'm, I guarantee, you know, of course they got the name from this card. So, <clears throat> all right. Next one, Alex. Next card Dominating Licid. Uh, I feel like. Uh, I think I even wrote this down. Uh, I think a lot of people already know about this. It's kind of famous, uh, well-known, whatever you want to say. Um, but I mentioned it a few weeks ago, a week or two ago, and I couldn't remember its name at the time. Mm -hmm. um, we were talking about control magic type abilities. This guy is one about colorless, two blue. This is a mouthful. You can pay one colorless, two blue, and tap it. By the way, it's a summon Lissid. There's a few Lissids in this set. Um, pay one colorless and two blue, tap him. Dominating Lissid loses this ability and becomes a creature enchantment that reads, gain control of enchanted creature instead of any other type of permanent. Move Dominating Lissid onto target creature. You may pay blue to end this effect. So... It is crazy wording, but basically you can turn him into a creature stealing enchantment, and then you can also turn him back. Mm -hmm. um, and you can do it quickly enough that you can respond to anything, basically, which makes it really, really hard to kill. I think he's great. So, yeah. <clears throat> reading a 4.44 on Gatherer, people agree with us. Also reserve list. Current market price of two twenty five, down significantly. I was looking at this last year during all the reserve list stuff, and yeah, I think I got one. Maybe I have one, but I think it was like a little higher than I wanted to pay for it. But yeah, nice to see that it's back down. We were talking about Lissids a couple of weeks ago. <coughs> I think in our brief little segment about Rootwater Matriarch. Oh, okay. We were talking about different enchantments you might want to put onto your opponent's creatures to then steal them with the matriarch. And in that context, one of the other lists came up. I think it was the green licit. Okay. Yeah. You mentioned that there were a, gr a group of lists, but this this guy's awesome. Uh, we might have been talking about the lists in another, some other context. I remember talking about. I was asking about control magic stuff for my commander deck, I think. I remember saying something about a control magic on a stick, but this is like another, and the, there might've been a control magic on a stick that was a forecasting cost creature, but this is this is a control magic on a stick on a three casting cost creature. 
it's a bitch to get rid of. Yeah. And actually, even if he's just hanging around as a 1-1 creature, I mean, not only can you not disenchant them if you have a blue around, because you can just convert them back to a creature. If he's just out as a creature and your opponent doesn't have anything to enchant, if you have three around and you have a creature in play, you can save him from creature yeah. removal too. Because you could just stick him on your own creature. Yeah, you could just smart, stick yeah. him on your own creature. Yeah, that's right. You have to have the mana around. To, I'm very smart, Alex. You have to have the mana around to do that. Yeah, but it's only three. Yeah. So this guy's really, I, I mean, I like him a lot. Yeah. So, so a lot of people point, not a lot of people, a person points out the best answer to this guy is the spell called Mortify. <clears throat> because Mortify says destroy target creature or enchantment. And the way that's worded is that, I guess, what he says, it's not a modal spell. So it'll kill it even if it changes between casting and resolution. Okay. Uh, when you go to like resolve this spell, as long as the thing is either a creature or enchantment, the spell will resolve and it will be destroyed. Okay. I never heard of this card. It was first printed well, in the new border set. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Interesting. Yeah. See, we're like Good slowly card. learning about the new cards here. One or two at a time. I can't go faster than that. It's too much. No. I live in the so bringing the, we're, we're bringing the heat now. Limited resources, dominating listed. I love the next one too. Oh, what's next? Oh, another card someone mentions. We haven't mentioned this in a while on here uh, is abeyance. You can use an abeyance to stop someone from using the list, the listed's abilities. Okay. Abeyance has come down a bit too, I believe. Yeah. Look at that. That's nice. Yeah, I was stoked when I got one for like seventeen dollars. I think I don't know how much I paid for mine. Somewhere in the teens, probably yeah, probably like fifteen, somewhere fifteen twenty. They were like over twenty, and I was like, oh, under twenty is good. My bottom because I really got, I really liked it. I still haven't made a deck with this yet, though. I have to. I think I have two of them. Uh, I don't play with it either. I've got to at some. It seems like a, a card that's massively underplayed, but I just also don't put it in my decks. I need to work it in. Seems so strong to me. I don't know. I, I really like it. Anyways. <clears throat> Next card, Alex. Pandemonium. Oh, yeah. Okay. You said you were going to put this in your Fires of Yevamaya deck, maybe. Three colorless, one red enchantment. Whenever any creature comes into play, that creature's controller may choose to have it deal damage equal to its power to target creature or player. Straightforward beat stick type card for even though it's not a stick it's an enchantment 4.21 on gatherer reprinted in time shift current market price at 329 i mean obviously use it with ball lightning use mm -hmm. it with sapperling burst or kavu is a good one. Yeah. and phyrexian dreadnought although mm -hmm. if you have a dreadnought out you know you're going to kill your opponent in two turns Probably anyways yeah. dreadnought deck you don't need to four mana to kill anybody, so you're probably going to want to not not bother with this. But I do want to put them in my uh, Fires of Yavimaya deck. I mean, a Sapling Burst with I, haste, if you have a Fires out, is great. If you have the Pandemonium out when you play the Sapling Burst, it's end of game. Is it? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Unless there's some are, weird are you rule speaking because figuratively, <laughs> unless some unless some weird, unless there's a rule where since sapling burst is an enchantment that doesn't count. But no, no, play, no. I'm just I'm like, how much damage does that do? Twelve. Okay. Plus you and have then, they and come then into play from the sapling tokens the next turn. Exactly. Okay. Right. Yeah, that's that's the thought. <clears throat> it's pretty much end of game. It's tough to deal with if you have hasty sapling burst and pandemonium. Now, yeah. that's a lot that you need to get on the board, and people are going to be aware of that. And oh, you're saying if you have the fires, you have to down? Yes. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. No, Even but if I mean, you it's don't, certainly a good combo. It's not, I don't think it's like, I'm not trying to shoot holes in it. Yeah. Even if you don't have fires and you can't swing with your uh, sapperlings with haste, it's still, you, yeah, it's you still... split your burst up into four, uh, three, four, fours, it's still 12 damage. 
Damn, that's good. Uh, they mention Alluren too. Uh, Enchantment from Tempest. Players may cast creature spells with mana of th- value of three or less without paying their mana costs and as though they had flash. So you just bu- bust down a bunch of free creatures. Okay. And they'll do the damage. Um, but yeah, I like this because it, uh, in a red deck, maybe you have a tension between like, do I want to go with creatures or with direct damage? And with this card, you can kind of like omit your direct damage because all of your creatures do direct damage. They can become direct And you can just focus on all creatures. Good in a goblin deck, good in a haste creature deck. Um, There are goblins here. So many of the cards we're pulling up from Exodus have goblins worked into the artwork. Huh. Um, yeah, I think the, the only thing you have to worry about with this card is that your opponent isn't outplaying you with creatures or playing enough creatures that they can disrupt you, like destroy your creatures. Um, yeah. But, you know, red is a good yes, card because because to be in. We have to point out this is this does work for your opponent too. It's for everybody on the board anytime a creature comes into play. Like you definitely probably want to be using a higher number of creatures, I would think, with this card, because you don't want them to play a creature and nuke your big threat. Um, you know, if they play a creature, you want to make sure that it can only destroy like one of several little things, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, creatures with higher power relative to toughness, you know, if you can get creatures that have like a, a good like power for their mana cost. Be a Sheena Sandstalkers. Okay. Ball lightnings. Ball lightning, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Pretty cool card. Next one, Alex. Miri Cat Warrior. Mm-hmm. And we know about her. We've seen her before. Um, but it's under five dollars and it's good, so you know, figured I'd at least mention it. Very good. I like it a lot. I brought her up on some oh, yeah. Yeah. She's... A, a recent a recent podcast. Uh Kind of as a reference point for some modern creature we were looking at. Yeah. It was also a three man. And I was like, I'm over here playing Mary Cat Warrior. And this person's playing this three <laughs> mana creature that does 17 different things. One colorless, two green, summon legend, two, three. Mary Cat Warrior counts as a cat warrior. It's my <laughs> favorite comment on Gather about this card left by Cat Party on. Oh, I didn't even see their name. That's funny. April 19th, 2014 at 1141 and 23 seconds PM. So at the middle in the middle of the night, Cat Party was making this comment on Gather years ago, 10 years ago. Miri Cat Warrior counts as a cat warrior. This changes everything. It is very weird. They had to point that out on yeah. the in the text of the That's, card. That line of text is definitely like an artifact from a specific moment of time where like they had not quite gotten rid of like some of the formatting, you know, awkwardness of previous sets. <laughs> first strike, force walk, attacking does not cause Miri to tap. That's my, I mean, first strike plus vigilance. I'm in. That's, yeah, that's, that's what gets me excited. Yeah. She's in my mono green uh, pre modern deck that's full of efficient small casting cost creatures. Plus Rancors, plus Elephant Guides. Slap an Elephant Guide on her. You got a 5-6 first striker with Vigilance. Strap a Rancor on her. Or 4 mana. You got a 4-3 first striker with Vigilance. The Forest Walk is just a bonus if you happen to be playing against another green deck. Love it. The next one you mentioned, Alex. This is a card that I bought a couple of many months ago. Oh, really? Because I got excited. And I, okay. But now I was now like, you, I don't know if I'm ever going to use it. Now that you say that, I thought there was something about this card that rang a bell with me. No, Brooch. It's a forecasting cost artifact. You can pay two mana and tap, discard your hand, counter target non creature spell, play this ability as an interrupt. This is the only printing of this card, although it's not reserved list. It has a rating of 4.02 on Gatherer. 
current market price of what am I looking at here? Four twenty-three, four dollars and twenty-three cents. I first saw this. I think you can scoop them for three bucks. I think I wrote three bucks on here. I think they're okay, a little lower than that, but yeah. I first saw this when I was thinking about doing graveyard stuff and I just randomly bought a bunch of cheap cards that interacted with your graveyard in some way or put things into okay. your graveyard. I also got excited that this provides some ability to counter spells for any color. I want to make it work, but it. it's harder to work than I think I realized because you don't just discard a card. You discard your whole damn hand. Yeah. So most of the time, I'm not going to want to do that. What if you don't have anything in your hand? That's that's the th that's the best part about this card is, that, yeah, people, you can use it when you don't have anything in your hand. So here's a stupid question. Do you just put it into a mono red deck where you just, yeah. you just that blow was my your first hand? Thought. It kind of, yeah. I, co I compared it to scroll rack, uh, a late game, like, thing that you can pour mana into. Yeah, uh, this would be interesting. I've never seen anybody put a null brooch in their mono red deck instead of a school rack. I guess the idea with red is you just go straight to the face as frequently as you can. So instead of a scroll rack, why not? Yeah. Like, why would you put a null brooch in where you're not doing damage? But yeah, and, you can just counter part, counter whatever they try to do. Yeah, the discard your hand thing is still tricky though because like sometimes you're still gonna have maybe just like one or two cards in your hand late game and you don't want to get rid of them. Yeah. So. I would like some some graveyard interaction. So like black red deck, maybe. Heat deck with some like a splash of black so you can bring some cards back if you have to send stuff to your graveyard. Yeah. So it got both of our attention, but yeah. and it's a couple dollars. I mean, it's three bucks or something, so someone's buying it. Yeah. I don't see it played a lot though. And if it was highly played, it'd probably be more expensive than this. I think probably. What happens is a lot of people, like you and me, see it and they're like, oh, counter ability for any color, any yeah. deck I, I play. And I'll then try this, then it goes in the stack and they never use it. <laughs> and then they find that it's hard to deal with, actually. Yeah. Moving on. We got Let's two more to go. Gary Fraggle. Two more rares from Exodus that are under $5 that we might try to brew something interesting with. Yeah. I think this, Equal I went, by the way, in ascending order of price so we're now on to like the most valuable card four dollars and 98 cents oh four dollars and 56 cent market price equilibrium one colorless two blue enchantment whenever you successfully cast a creature spell you may pay one colorless to return target creature to owner's hand has a current rating of 4.46 on gather i really like this card and actually i, I bought i bought a couple because uh, I love bounce spells. I love enter the battlefield stuff. You can use this. I love creature based decks. Put this out, play a lot of creatures, use it to bounce your opponent's creatures, use it to bounce your own enter the battlefield creatures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, also good in ornithopter deck. Also good in ornithopter decks, if you say so. What, what's, what about the ornithopter deck? <laughs> <laughs> I can lay down my ornithopter for zero and bounce creatures with it. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so basically it's just a one mana boomerang. Mm -hmm. And then you yeah, can... Yeah, I like that. It's, you know, in a bounce deck, I would definitely put this in to add more bounce. Mm -hmm. You have to cast a creature spell. You can't generate yes. a creature token and use this, but... True. So you got to have a fairly creature-heavy deck. Yeah. Or at least... Which might be hard in blue. It... What'd you say? Which might be hard in blue. Yeah. Or at least you play it in a deck where you have creatures that you can continuously get back to your hand. Which might be nice. Like Blue-black would be cool if you're recycling creatures. Or like a squee, for instance. Squee. Oh, okay. The yeah. All right. I read a card. I don't know if I have it in. If it made it into the show or not today. I read a card that had a quote about squeeze cooking, making everyone sick. I don't know. Is that not recycle? It has no. It's uh no. That's a good guess though. It actually has a creature that looks the same as the creature on Null Brooch. Um, that's apparently some sort of species or tribe of thing that I don't know about. Uh, I have no clue. Creepy Fraggles from Exodus. Anyways, keep going. I'll talk. I'll find it. I said we got two more, but actually that was. Kind of. It was the last one that you really wanted to talk about. You had some honorable mentions, though. 
was the last one you wanted to spend time on. Were there any yeah. of the honorable mentions you really wanted to like review? Because there were a couple. Uh, man, at least Vorath's one. Dungeon. I don't know. Do you think that's worth talking about? I don't know it at all. So I don't think it it's great, but it's kind of cool. It's another lockdown card. It's an enchantment. Two black, two colorless. Uh, any player may, fa- play, may pay five life to destroy Volrath's dungeon. Okay. Choose and discard a card. Target player chooses a card in his or her hand, puts that card on top of his or her library, play this ability as a sorcery. So you can okay. discard cards to make them put their hand on top of their library. Okay. Um, in black, if you have a way to get your cards back out of your graveyard, you know, like a graveyard type theme to your deck, like mm-hmm. I could see this maybe working. Uh, once you do it a few times, you've emptied out their hand and stacked their, you know, you've kind of put them a lot behind you. Uh, so I could see it. It doesn't have a good rating, really, though. Um, and it, I don't know. What do you think about it? I think it'd be hard to build around. Again, my mind just goes immediately to Squee because you can just discard Squee and get them back. But okay. is this the best thing you can do with Squee? Probably not. Probably Squee would be better in an equilibrium deck. And that's not even nearly the best thing you could do with Squee. Squee's probably yeah. better in a lot of other things instead. Yeah, I agree. So it's all right. It might be fun in a limited environment to try to brew something with it. You know, it's not going to be a high-powered deck. Yeah, it's definitely a kitchen table card. It's not, yeah, anything crazy. Another, uh, you mentioned Plague Bearer as a... Uh, oh, yeah. Mentioned. You liked it, and yeah. I think I was, looking, was right. It's good for killing small creatures. I was looking through zombie decks, and I'm like, ooh, I might put... I was looking through zombies, because... As I've said on the podcast a few times now, and as all our viewers know, I will be building a pre-modern zombie deck uh, in late 2023, potentially early 2024. So I'm reviewing zombies. Plague Bearer is a zombie from Exodus. It's a rare. It's one color. It's one black, one, one. You can pay one black in XX colorless to destroy target non-black creature with total casting costs equal to X. So it's three mana to, to kill a, a one drop, but... There's a lot of pain in the ass one drops. It's true. Yeah, it's great at killing one drops, but I mean, you're never going to use it for anything other than a one drop, right? Like, no, not really. And it takes five mana, you know. But yeah, you you're right. Yeah, you kill some for a two drop. Manimals or some one casting cost, like little annoying creatures, it would be good. I will or- fuck up your Ornithopters with this guy. True. Keep talking That's about true. Oh, shit. Yeah, that would murder Ornithopters. And they shouldn't even be susceptible to acid vomit breath there. Artifact creatures flying up. I think that's ridiculous. They're too high up. Is gnarly. It's like a giant goiter zombie vomiting acid into someone's face and dissolving his face, uh, which I respect. Um, as a zombie, as a zombie do. It, it, but but it might you know you might have to be careful about playing this card against some small children. Children. They want to scare <laughs> the children. Mom's back in the 90s would have had a fit about Plague Bear. Oh, yeah. Yeah. If Mrs. Price had seen Plague Bear. Yeah. By the way, for anyone who doesn't know, Mrs. Price confiscated one of our friend's magic card boxes <laughs> in that, in eighth grade. A small little box of cards, but it has his playing deck with, I believe, a play set of Volcanic Islands in it. I, I was going to say it's definitely. He played Red Blue and he had Volcanic Islands, and uh, he got that confiscated and never got it back. And the school district should be sued for thousands of dollars. I know. I know. <laughs> I why was that okay? Why is that okay? I'm thinking about it now. Like, why was it ever okay that I can understand why it's okay for a teacher to tell you you can't have something like in class, but also I don't think he was playing with the cards in class. No, probably not not, not doing anything bad, you know. But they let's used say to every- the shit where they'd say you'll get it back at the end of the year, you know. We're in a confi- and the, then the teacher she retired and didn't come back. <laughs> why yeah, why was it ever, up. even the end of the year, that's not acceptable. Why would it ever be okay yeah, for your property for a school to ever take something from you and keep it actually until the end of the day? Like, because children don't have rights. Yeah. We just didn't, didn't argue it. And I guess maybe the his parents didn't say anything about it. Right. Yeah. You have to get your parents involved to go fight for you on that one. Cause they're not going to listen to you. Did but yeah, retire? that sucks. Place she it on volcanic islands. Probably ended up in the school dumpster. 
hopefully taken home by someone, you know, and they survived. She got cancer, that teacher, by the way. I'm not saying the two things are related. <laughs> but that is why she didn't come back. I know she she was ill and did not return. <laughs> okay, okay. I think maybe she came back later. I don't I never followed up uh Mrs. Price, but I think we would have heard if she wasn't okay. At least in the near term. Hmm. On to one more card, one more honorable mention that I thought was pretty good. Okay. You didn't put this in your honorable I, mention, but I looked at this briefly and then I skipped it because I was trying to keep the list short. But let's talk okay. about it. we're talking about Exodus yeah. today. We already made the list long. Yeah. One more. Seismic Assault. This would also be in a red. This would be for a red aggro deck. It's three red. Enchantment. Originally printed in Exodus. Also reprinted in 8th edition. And what else? 7th edition, 10th edition, and Ultimate Masters. It's an inexpensive card. You can purchase it for a $1.83 market price right now. You probably get them cheaper than that on TCG Player. Choose and discard a land card. Seismic Assault deals two damage to target creature or player. So again, I'm just thinking a red deck, you're emptying your hand. Maybe once you have four mountains out, you don't really care about having any more mountains out. You can turn any excess mountains into two damage, two creatures or players. I like that you can target both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought about this. It's definitely a good finisher. You could, you know, drop some cards from your hand for no mana to kill someone. Um. My concern with it was, I guess, just that, like, late in the game, how many land cards are you going to have in your hand to discard? Um, you just, yeah, you just have to top deck one and that you didn't want to use for anything or else. Or you have to deliberately save some, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. forego playing them. And maybe you don't need them, so maybe that's okay. Maybe you have five or, five or six lands down and you, you don't actually need to play it, so you just hold on to it. You just have to plan ahead a little. Uh, and th now that I'm thinking about this, in a in a red deck from this era, you're going to want to have four f fire blasts too. Okay. I would not forego fire blasts in place of seismic assault, and those fire blasts are going to eat eat mountains. So right. in a in a deck where you're already going to eat mountains for a big finisher, do you want to put in another card that's going to do less damage? It does an equal amount of damage for an equal amount of mana lost. Pitch two cards, two mountains to deal four damage. But you have to play it for three mana. I think in a world where Fire Blast exists, you don't worry about Seismic Assault. Probably not. Potentially. Okay. Fine, Alex. Don't Update. play Seismic Assault. I found the card I was looking for. It's called Medicine Bag. Never heard of it. <laughs> As well, you should not have. Don't even know that it's real. But it has this dark crystal Jim Henson guy on it again. <clears throat> oh, yeah. I have seen this. Choose and discard a card. Regenerate target creature. A medicine bag and I have treated countless wounds and illnesses, but never have I seen so many made sick for so long. We will never eat squeeze cooking again. <laughs> or him. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what those things are. Yeah, I'll have to look that up. But yeah, I thought about I saw that quote the other day, and I, you mentioned Squee, so I thought I'd bring it up. Okay. Moving on. That's the end of our cheap, affordable rares from Exodus that we might want to brew with. Yeah. Some some big hitters in there, I think. I really love Equilibrium. I love Miri. Very, that's a very straightforward card. It's just a good creature. I love Pandemonium. I've do I love Dominating Licit. I love Limited Resources. I really want to try to brew with that. I love Paladin Vec, another just solid creature. And yeah. uh, I never thought about Thopters, but Thopter Squadron. Yeah, it's not I great, makes, I don't think. But but it makes for some fun Thopter building. I, think. I would play around because I, I have a thing about trying to make Ornithopter related decks. Uh, so yeah. I, I would goof around with it. You're not going to win the pre-modern uh, no. North American Championship in no. 20. 24 with your top deck, but who cares? No. What do you want to talk about now, Alex? We're going know, how are we doing? Segment. How long have we been recording? Should we move on to the I commander have, segment? I have no clue. It's oh. up to you. Do you want to talk about some some recent ads or do you want to some I mean some recent purchases or do you want to say that for your next next episode? 
Mm-hmm. We can just do recent purchases next episode. We could uh... Yeah, maybe we'll do it next episode because I was looking at some cheap stronghold. We did stronghold and now we're on Exodus. And I went back and I found a couple of 20 cent cards from Stronghold. So maybe I'll add them in too. Uh okay. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll hold on. We're, we're moving on for now. We're moving on to segment three, which is the old man magic commander corner. It is time. For the Old Men Magic Commander Corner, this is where the old men now do two things. It started off with just us building our first ever commander decks. They are old frame only commander decks because that's pretty much what we have. That's what we know. I get confused when I see modern cards. Today, we pulled up a card that had two different colors in one of the mana symbols. It blew my mind. I don't understand what's going on. (laughs) I don't want to know what's going on. Not yet. I'm not ready for it. So we're old frame only. But starting last week, we added another wrinkle to the Old Man Magic Commander Corner, where we're also using this segment as a time for us to learn about what cards from these old sets the kids are playing these days. I forgot all about them. So last week, we talked very briefly about some of the most commonly played Tempest cards in Commander. And now I just want to take a quick look at the most commonly played Stronghold cards from Commander next week. We'll look at the Exodus cards. Okay. So I'm going to pull up some EDH rec here. This is where I'm going. If anybody else, Back to <laughs> yeah. If anybody else knows where to go for uh, cool EDH information, let me know. But EDH rec is where I'm going right now. I'm going to go to all the sets. I'm going to browse all these sets. Look at these sets, Alex. This is so much magic kind of gathering out there. Sets. This we can keep this podcast going forever. People, we're still all the way back here. Yeah. In Exodus. I don't know anything that happened after this for the most part. What are the most commonly played cards in Exodus, Alex? I looked at this briefly the other day, and it's almost nothing. (laughs) Exodus is not a highly played set in Commander. Tempest, there was some stuff that was kind of up there in popularity. Ancient Tomb was in like 12% of the decks on EDH Rec. Here you have a couple commanders. Of course, this is pretty much 0% of the decks. There's just a couple monocolored legends. Miri, Cat, Warrior, Wizard, Adept, Air Tie. The popular cards in Exodus. None of the cheap rares that we talked about today. There's a few things that we've talked about in previous episodes. Soul Warden. This is a cleric. Maybe if we build our cleric decks, we can put Soul Warden in in those decks. I don't know Soul Warden yet. One white, one one cleric. Whenever another creature enters the battlefield, you can go. Okay. So this is the kind of thing you're going to put in when you're playing a four a four player format, right? Lots yeah, of creatures are going to be showing up. That's nice. I like that. <clears throat> Coat of arms. We've talked about this briefly. The tribal card, yeah. Tribal card only in two percent of decks, but you know most commander decks I can't I guess aren't tribal decks. Calling of the one week, of one of your favorites from Exodus. Favorites. This is a highly priced uh, common from an old set. Sacrifice creature to generate mana. Curiosity. Don't know this card at all. One blue enchant creature. Whenever enchanted creature deals damage to opponent, you may draw a card. I like that. I'm playing around with... Exactly. I'm playing around with shadow. I can turn all of my other shadow creatures into shadow made what's-his-faces. (laughs) <laughs> shadow 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 mage watch his faces <laughs> you know what i'm talking about you got me there shadow guild mage i was going to show you some shadow creatures from exodus i have a couple one or two i found let me look this up real quick my browser's again not cooperating shadow mage shadow guild i'm gonna type in shadow oh yeah i'll get you there <laughs> shadow mage infiltrator is that a thing yes yeah. Did I get it's it? It's one one colorless, one blue, one black, one one or two two. Yeah. Every oh, time it does a damage, you draw a card. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. Okay. That's it. That's what it. is it again? Shadow Mage Infiltrator? Yes. Okay. Shadow so Mage. Curiosity, okay. Curiosity can turn. Sorry, good. What? curiosity can turn all of your shadow creatures 
into Shadow Mage Infiltrators. That's all I was okay. going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Shadow Mage Infiltrator can't be blocked except by artifact creatures or black creatures. And whenever he deals damage to a player, you may draw a card. That's pretty Survival cool. Survival the... has the fear built in. Not bad. Yeah. Survival of the fittest, uh, 3% of decks. Probably my favorite card from Exodus. I can see why it's not in more decks. It's very expensive. Spellbook, interesting. 1% of decks. You have no maximum hand size. We've talked about reconnaissance before. I've yeah. considered putting good this card. in my in my commander deck. I haven't yet, but this is good for any combat focused deck because it makes for a lot of very difficult combat decisions on your opponent's end. Play zero, remove target attacking creature you control from combat and untap it. And then everything after that is just you know one percent of decks. So not a lot of Exodus play in Commander. City of Traders, Merfolk Loader, Mer Merfolk Looter. Sphere of Resistance and Forbid. These are all good cards that I know. That's it, Alex. Once you get into Mind of Matter, hate, Hatred, you're getting into cards that are in 0% of Commander decks. So it's not a very it's not a very popular not a very popular commander set. I think two cards in particular, if they weren't so expensive, City of Traders and Survival of Fittings <clears> would see <throat> a lot more commander play. But I think those cards are being handicapped by the fact that they're two hundred to four hundred dollars. That'll do it. That'll do it. Here's a card that I just was trying to find and managed to find: um, Sleeper's Robe. Uh, this is an enchantment that I put in that blue-black deck that I played against you with, and it does something similar to what we were just talking about. It, uh, card draw? Card draw? The Shadow Mage the Infiltrator? It does the same, both same things, but it's an enchantment instead of a creature. I hope you remember, because I already forgot what I said and I put it away. <laughs> I was just going to ask Sleeper's you what it's called again. <laughs> Sleeper's Rope. <laughs> So it's maybe a better curiosity. Is that what you're telling me? Oh, because it uh, gives. I'll have to think about that. Yeah, it's more mana. Okay, because curiosity just uh, gives you the card draw ability, and I yeah. say, this oh, you put you it on a shadow two. creature, and it's this one gives black one okay. okay, so you could either play curiosity in a shadow deck, or you could play sleeper's robe and give all yeah. your creatures in a shadow. Deck. Okay, okay, I like it. Yeah, I think that's a cool card. Black blue. But now we're moving on to the meat of the Commander Corner, Alex. This is where we build our decks. This is the segment that people love. This is why they come to the Old Man Magic podcast. They want to see, they want to see how the our first ever Commander decks turn out. Alex's deck is named Group Mud. My deck is named The Pump. This is Alan Comer's Turbo Xerox deck from 1997, which we will be talking about in an upcoming really? episode. Really? Yeah. No, you're not goofing? <laughs> no, I'm not goofing. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote some, I pre-wrote some show notes. I wanted to talk about Xerox decks, Alan. Oh, okay. I don't know what that I'm is, but right. I can sort of guess. You're going to learn. And you're going to be wrong. Oh! Because I thought I knew what a Xerox deck was. It has nothing, it doesn't sound like at all what it is. Oh, Okay. My commander is Jacques Lever, Jacques Lever, Jacques Devert, Jake the Green. <laughs> Jake one colorless, <laughs> one white, one green, one red, three, two, summon legend. All your green creatures gain plus zero, plus two. He is not highly played in commander, according to EDH rec, but I'm playing him because I love. That's because people have no taste, Steve. They have no taste. I love the original legendary creatures from Legends. Yeah. These are the creatures that inspired. EDH, they're the creatures that inspired. Why we're here with the EDH Elder Dragon uh, uh, Highlander. I mean, not specifically these legendary creatures. Specifically, the Elder Dragons inspired it, but still, yeah, but still, these are the cards that I loved the most when I was a kid, and I couldn't get my hands on the old cards. Dusty at Hot Shots had all these legendary creatures. I thought they were sweet. When I came back to Magic, 
some of the first cards I bought were the Elder Dragons and Sulkin or the Swamp King. I hope one day Dusty Hunter. comments in our comment section. That would make I'm me so waiting. Happy. I mean, anybody could just pretend like they were Dusty, and I, I wouldn't know. I don't know I'm Dusty's dusty. real name. <laughs> don't know anything about him. True. Just know that he had cool cards. And he never ripped me off like some of the other people there. Some of the other old older guys that would sell a kid on his birthday. Uh, uh, an, oh, an unlimited icy manipulator right when they knew that they were being reprinted in, in Ice Age and not tell me and then laugh about it after they just ripped off a 12 year old. Way to go, guys. You guys are awesome. You rock, you sons of bitches. Doesn't matter. That icy manipulator is worth Did more. Did you pull that guy out of the lineup now, Steve? No. Oh, too bad. But if anybody listening, Frequented hot shots back in the day in Mahoney County. You were County. the guy at hot shots that treated knows that story. Tell me the name of that guy. I will find him. As you can see, since my commander is Jacques Lever, I have a white, green, red deck. My deck is called the Pump because I'm trying to pump all my creatures. Jacques Lever pumps their toughness. Keza will give all my green creatures plus one, plus one. I'm starting to forget all of the other pump effects I have in my deck. That's okay. We recap can in a long it. time. Wiley Wolf can tap to give any creature I have plus one plus one. I can pump with Berserk. I can pump with Giant Growth. I can pump with Power Matrix. I can pump with Fires of Yavamaya. If I sacrifice the Fires of Yavamaya, my Rory's Rake gives me additional mana. Plus, it pumps all my creatures plus one plus one. Rancors will pump. Armadillo Cloaks will pump. Pendlehaven will pump select one once. I also put a lot of tramplers in this deck because I love tramplers. In addition to that, I'm going a little bit of a token generator route because I love legendary creatures so much because one day I got drunk and I bought a Hazes on Tamar for $250 <laughs> online in the middle of the night. So I'm like, fuck, I need to build token generation into this deck. Hazes on Tamar makes a bunch of Sand Warrior tokens. They're also green tokens, so they can be pumped by Keza, by Jacques Lever. Tonight, Alex, I'm going to add a big creature that we've talked about before. Oh. I mean, he's just, he's physically actually big. Verdant Force. Oh, yay. I love Verdant Force. I'm going for a big green stompy deck, a uh, token generator deck. This guy's a big green stomper and he generates a 1-1 one, one green sapling token for me. Every upkeep. He's the perfect natural Every order upkeep. target. Not just your, that's the key. Not just your upkeep. Especially for commander. Every upkeep. Switch give, printing. Give me the tokens. Yes. Yes, I do have the money to purchase an original Tempest. We have to break the bank. Verdant Force. I didn't have to get drunk to buy this guy. I can make this purchase sober. Verdant Force. Perfect See natural order target. And if I add a card that we talked about last episode, Heart of the Something or Other, Defense of the Heart, I think defense it's of Defense the heart, of the Heart. Yeah. I can pull Verdant Force up. With that card as well. I might add yeah, that yeah. guy. Nice. Steve, I don't want to distract you, but I thought of a card that I want to show you for your deck. Okay. You can do your next card first if you want. That's it. That's okay. it for today. Okay. Verdant Force. Uh, I don't think you might not add this guy because he has a high casting cost, but I think Natural he's pretty order. Cool. Look up Natural Multani. Order. Oh, yeah, yeah. Look up Multani. Oh, you saw him? The Morrow Warrior. I've considered Multani. Uh, he was just in a deck that I was looking at the other day. Maro Sorcerer. It's yeah. star star dependent on number of something in the somethings. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like it. <laughs> something <laughs> of the somethings. Four colors, two green, summon legend, star star. Has power and toughness each equal to the total number of cards in all players' hands. Multani cannot be the target of spells or abilities. I forgot about the last part, which is really Second sweet. part is... because. He, he'll get smaller over the course of the game, probably. You know, once you get him down, he'll be pretty big whenever you get him down. And then someone gets eliminated from the game. Someone empties out their hand. He might shrink. Uh, you know what I do, though? I, I love cards like this that can synergize with, like, some other card in my deck. It doesn't, like, fit an overall theme of the deck. 
but I have a lot of different yes. like interesting two, three card combos that yeah, can me, really me too. That's what's fun about Commander so far to me is that you get this opportunity to make like little connections like all through your deck. So Maltani, I'm dreaming of having this guy on the on the board. And I've also generated, say, a bunch of tokens from Spontaneous Generation or from Verdant Force or from Hazazon or from Deranged Hermit. And then I play. Watch, watch me have not put this card in my deck yet. I didn't put it in my deck yet. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't I just add it now? Add it now, Steve. In order to add it now, I have to remember what it is. Oh, shit. What color is it? I'll help. It's green, and I draw a card for every creature I have in play. We talked about this before. Let me look this up. Yeah, draw a card for every creature you control. Will Gatherer help me? Will Scryfall help me? This is why people come to this podcast. This is what they love. They love the spontaneity. They love that we don't always know what we're going to talk about until we like, start talking. How about fast it. can they look it up? Let's see. They love collective unconscious. Collective unconscious. Okay. I don't remember when we talked about this card, but we did. So the collective unconscious. Oh, remember the episode we did on generating uh, card advantage in green? Oh, okay, okay. It's a big casting cost. Yeah. But this is a big bomb. But it's a big bomb. Draw a creature or draw a card for each creature you control. So let's say I got a bunch of tokens in play. Got a bunch of creatures in play because I have a creature horde deck. I play collective unconscious. The, the thing that I didn't like so much about this card when I was play testing it is sometimes I have too many creatures out and then I draw too many cards. I end up having to discard a bunch of stuff because oh. I simply don't have the mana to play all the cool shit that I'm drawing. Mm. But this would be an interesting finisher when combined with Maltani. Let's say you got like, let's say I just mm -hmm. played a spontaneous generation or a sapling symbiosis. I already had like a couple that. tokens out because of mm. uh, Verdant Force. I have like 17 creatures out. Play Collective Unconscious, draw 17 cards, swing at you with my 17, 17 Multani. Hell yeah. This is a dream of mine now. I don't have Multani in the deck yet, though, so I got to add them. And, and Collective Unconscious could go well black-green, because if you overdraw and have to discard, then you've stocked up your graveyard. Unfortunately, <clears throat> I'm not playing black. Right. Yeah. So maybe I'll take this guy out of my deck. But he's in for now. Maybe Multani will go in next next episode. That's it for me today, Alex. Collective Unconscious and Verdant Force. Sweet. I love potentially, Verdant Force. Potentially Multani next, next episode. We're now moving on to Alex's deck. For a long time, Alex did not have a name for his deck. He named it maybe like six episodes ago, five, six episodes ago. Group Mud, a.k.a. Mud Hole. It is group mud. Then we learned about the card mud hole. He's considering changing the name to mud hole. Is not transition somewhat yet. from a group hug deck to a pillow fort style deck. I'm playing a defensive diplomatic deck. Some help from my opponents. Some uh, uh, control over what happens between my opponents. I'm trying to sit back. I have a lot of enchantments in my deck. I have a lot of defensive creatures in my deck. Um, scroll down for me a little bit, please. What are Remember we here? what is in the deck. I want to go to creatures. I'm at like 20 creatures. 26. Keep going. 20 creatures, six sorceries, eight instants. It says three artifacts, but I only see two. So I'm up in <laughs> mid 40s. I don't know 11 why. Enchantments. 11 enchantments. Okay, so I have lots of room. I have, I have room still. I, I can add about 15 or 20 cards, I think, without it my. It has length. room to grow. Okay, good, good. All right. Uh, first, how about a land? I am going okay. to add Dromar's Cavern. The reason I am adding Dro Dro Dromar's Cavern, the three-color lair land, um, I'm going heavy green. I want to be able to have green 
early on. Uh, most of my basic lands are probably going to be forests, and I'm going to try to get my other mana through multicolored lands, things like that. Uh, so I figured I probably don't need green in the tricolored land, I so I omitted the green colored ones, and then I picked my next three most prevalent colors, which are white, blue, and black. Um, and I can bring this guy out. I can sacrifice my gemstone mine if I have to, once I've already used it twice. Um, or I can just return a forest that I don't need since I have a couple forests down to get my white, blue, and black mana. Not sacrifice your gemstone mine. Bring return, your gemstone yeah, mine back to your mine. hand. Yeah, that's even better. Yeah. Um, so that's a little multicolored land I'm going to add. Uh, I have a removal. Will you please remove Island Sanctuary for me? It's oh, terrible and was just a placeholder one one episode when I couldn't come up with what to add. Uh, you may decline to draw a card from your library during draw phase in exchange until start of your next turn. The only creatures that may attack you are those that have that those that fly or have island walk. Okay. People use Never. it. It's in some lists on like EDH Rec for defensive decks, but I don't want to hamper my card drawing. Uh yeah, so yeah. Since I added propaganda last week, I feel like that's a good replacement. I'll get that guy out of here. Um, here's a new card for you. Last week, we or two weeks ago, we talked about Shaman and Core, which I thought about, and I might still add because it's pretty good, but I'm going to add Spirit and Core today. Don't know that one. Oh, look, your third artifact showed up, Alex. Oh, there I it is. I don't know why this wasn't showing up before. Yeah, don't forget Howling Mine. I like that guy. Spirit and core. Spirit and core. This is another defensive creature. He has an ability similar to Shaman and core. He can redirect damage. Except he's flying. So I'm going to put him in because of the flying. And that'll make him a better blocker. Here we are. Whoa. Whoa. Interesting artwork. He's one white, three colorless, summon spirit, flying 2-2. Two, two. You can spend zero to redirect one damage him from him to a creature you control. So this guy's a good blocker, and I can like send the damage to my Will of the Wisp and regenerate him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I was looking at Blinking Spirit. I'm not sure if I'm gonna add that yet. That's an old classic blocker from Ice Age that you can return to your hand. I decided yeah. to put this guy in for now. Um, but I'll think about that. I have another card, Steve, if you want. Okay. Can I throw one more card in? Yeah. I'm looking at other things in your deck. You can gen uh, redirect that damage to. Spectral Lynx is also a Yeah, I have a few regenerators. I thought about adding a Spirit Monger to this deck as well, which I might do as one of my... I'm going I'm to put like one or two more big baddies in for finishers. So I'm thinking about him. Um, one more enchantment. I don't know. I don't know if I have too many yet, but I'm I'm gonna. I have a, there's a couple more enchantments I like, and I found this in Exodus. Since we were talking about Exodus, predatory hunger. This is another enchantment that lets things I have grow while I sit back defensively. I can let something get bigger to become a threat later. And I can also use it on my opponent's creatures if I want to change the balance of things happening in the game. Don't uh, know this one, one green. It's an aura. Whenever any opponent successfully casts a creature spell, put a plus one plus one counter on enchanted creature. Okay. What do you think about that card, Steve? I don't not like it. Still has the problem that all enchantments have, not all enchantments. Yeah, but I know it, it, it makes a two for one. Two for one. Yeah. And it's gonna make whatever you put it on is now going to become a target. Yes. And you have to you have to prepare for that. So but, but I can this, put him on a will of the wisp. I kind of like that. Yeah. Yes, you could put them on anything that regenerates. And since that makes I have it even harder to get rid of. I have a creature or two who operate with plus one, plus one counters. So like on my um, uh, Forgotten Ancient, if I put this on him, he'll get more plus one, plus one counters, and then I can transfer them off of Spread him, him around. onto other creatures. Yeah. Well, it has the downside that most enchantments have, enchant creatures have, the two-for-one issue. It also 
uh, benefits from multiplayer formats, mm-hmm. like a commander. Yeah, and it's only because one. you're going to have more opponents casting creature spells. So I like it. I like it. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'm going to throw that in. We'll try it out. I'm definitely going to use this in like 60 card head to head decks too. I do. I do like them though. You said Willow. I do like them on her generator, like <laughs> like a Will of the Wisp. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Because they're both one casting cost, so you can get that out fast. You can put it on a Wisp here. fast. Mm-hmm. This guy has a lot of time to get bigger throughout the game. Okay. I was trying to think the other day why I was making a five color deck. I couldn't remember. I was like, I don't know why I'm making a five color deck. Um, because that was like my starting point in all of this. I'm like, what you know, what commander I can either. I pick for a five color deck? And I couldn't really remember. And then I and then I did remember, and I think it was basically just because if you try to make a four color deck, that's just about as hard. Like there aren't really a lot of four color commanders either. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, and I didn't want to make just a three color deck. So I was kind of like, I'll go five color. You could put them on your wall of roots too, and then there's potentially more than five mana there. Like he could, every creature play could be a mana. There you go. That's a good idea. Very good. Very good. Thanks. I'm so good. You're the best, Steve. I think out of the box all the time. Nobody's brain works like mine. (laughs) Anyways, there we go. Okay. Commander decks coming together. We're getting there. Yeah. I feel a little better about mine. That's, I feel like I still feel like it's weak, but it's feeling it's, stronger every week. It's coming together, yeah. This is a learning process, Alex. How do we make a hundred card singleton deck? Neither you nor I have ever brewed a hundred card singleton deck. I think that brings us to the end of episode forty-five of the Old Man Magic Podcast. We did it. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Thanks for listening this long. I know you did. We really appreciate it. If you haven't yet. Please give us a like. Please subscribe. Please hit that notification bell. Please come back every Wednesday on YouTube. You could also find us on Apple Podcasts on Spotify. Last week I was way behind. I'm diligent every week about uploading to YouTube, but I don't always have time to convert and then upload to our RSS feed to get it onto uh, Apple Podcasts and Spotify. But this is another thing I did yesterday. I made some clips, Alex, and I also converted the last like six or seven episodes. And we're now up to date on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. So if you prefer the audio format, you can listen to us there. I don't know why you wouldn't want to see our beautiful faces, though. Alex, do you have anything to say to the viewers before we leave? They can be words of wisdom. They can be <laughs> words of non-wisdom. Oh, man. You could just say bye. Thank you for tuning in. Happy holidays. Happy June. Stay hydrated. Happy, happy Father's Day. I think you used that one before, but that's ever good. Did I, I mean, really? Always no, good you, advice. Oh, you have to stay hydrated. That's important. Every day. If you go even one day without hydrating, you're in trouble. So I think that's perfectly reasonable advice to give the viewers every week. So, okay. See you next week, everybody. Later. <laughs>